All right. And yeah, just still a couple more people joining us. So yeah, this uh, Stewards in Motion webinar is brought to you by Land Stewardship Centre. And my name is Kelsey Norton. I coordinate outreach for Land Stewardship Centre. I also have Alyssa Metro from the Government of Alberta joining us today for presentation, as well as Bob Montgomery from Beaver Hills Biosphere. And with that, uh, I'll like to <clears throat> let them introduce themselves when it kind of comes time. But if anyone's having kind of any connection issues, I do recommend that you uh, turn your video off. It's kind of the best method to help your bandwidth. So uh, me living in rural Alberta, that is something that I have to do <laughs> just in case it drops me. So turn that off. Um, so throughout the webinar, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to ask them at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can either raise your hand at the end or put that in the comment section. Uh, some proper etiquette, I'm sure as most of you are aware with uh, online kind of sessions nowadays, uh, there is no uh, exceptions for abusive behavior or any comments. Uh, there's no tolerance for that whatsoever or offensive language, you will be removed immediately. Uh, no speaking or drawing on the screen during the presentation. It's uh, immensely distracting, <laughs> I'm sure you know, for the presenter. And it's just great to have the floor without any distractions. Uh, and yeah, so if you find your, again, with a poor connection, just turn off your video. It can kind of help with that. And with that, let's dive in. So uh, this, chat, uh, this webinar is just a great chance for people to kind of network, learn, and kind of celebrate uh, some engagement and relationship building with Indigenous communities. Uh, but Sturge in Motion has, uh, since 2003, brought people uh, and organizations together with common goals, uh, kind of being able to motivate stewards to continue their work uh, to conserve Alberta's beautiful landscapes. And so we connect on, uh, with all different levels, regardless of focus, affiliation, or discipline, in a way to collectively think and protect our valuable common natural assets. Uh, <clears throat> the purpose of this particular Stewards in Motion is to highlight the need for non-Indigenous organizations uh, to work on building trust and acknowledging that Indigenous traditional insights and is valuable towards research and monitoring and <clears throat> in order to conserve biodiversity and ecosystems. Uh, I myself am not an expert uh, on this topic and I'm also non-Indigenous. However, since I was young, I have found myself kind of involved with Indigenous communities in my personal life. And now professionally, it also has become kind of a stronger pull and effort as well. And so over the years, there's just been this undeniable uh, need for a lot of people and organizations to connect, build relationships and trust with Indigenous communities. And the aim of this webinar is to inspire kind of that conversation and generate some ideas on how to create pathways towards that uh, lasting and long relationship. And with that, so I'd like to uh, provide a land acknowledgement. Um, uh, <clears throat> and if you uh, yourself would like to as well, you can do that in the comments section, if that is something you would like to do. So Land Stewardship Centre is situa situated within Treaty 6 territory. However, our efforts take us throughout the Alberta region, <clears throat> how, uh, home to many diverse Indigenous communities. We strive to engage with, learn from, and build lasting relationships with these communities. The importance of Indigenous knowledge towards understanding and respecting the natural environment is vital. Land Stewardship Centre recognizes that Indigenous peoples have been and remain the, rem the original stewards of the land since time immemorial. And I do have a couple polls that I'd like to launch just to kind of gauge who our audience is today. So I'll launch that first one. And hopefully you can all kind of see it on your screen there. And I'll give a few second so yes yeah, so how have you as an individual uh the next question is kind of your affiliation with an organization but yeah engaged with or learned about indigenous communities and cultures yeah. wait till we at least get around 70 percent of people participating all right well, it's still keep going up <laughs> It looks like it's pretty awesome so far. So I'm gonna share the results with everyone. So yeah, 94% as an individual has participated and we do have an awesome little chunk of indigenous people and it's great to uh, see that for sure. So thank you all so much. And I do have a second poll here that I would like to launch. 
So has the organization that you're affiliated with, so not just as an individual, um, engaged with the Indigenous community or learned about Indigenous culture? So some more people joining us as well. So I'm gonna end that one there and share the results. So, and I was kind of wondering, yeah, so um, I figured, yeah, kind of within the last five years, but it is, yeah, kind of that growing uh, effort. So that's awesome to see as well. And I'll stop sharing that. All right. So uh, once again, yeah, my name is Kelsey Norton. So I coordinate outreach for Land Stewardship Center. I'd like to just delve into kind of uh, who our organization is. Um, so I coordinate the social media platform. So I'm sure that's probably how a few of you maybe found out about this webinar today. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I kind of connect with various stakeholders from governments to fellow environmental nonprofits, uh, write newsletters. And historically, we used to go to in-person workshops and kind of conferences, but has obviously turned to this online format. And if you hear me mention LSE, that's just our acronym for short. Uh, we recently celebrated our 25th anniversary, so 25 years of our stewardship legacy. And so ideally, like, we just picture people coming together because at the time when LSE was kind of first forming, the thought around conservation and biodiversity uh, usually was kind of in the hands of land trusts, kind of with conserva uh, conservation easements or protected places. And so we realized that we need to work with landowners, communities, and create that bigger picture of environmental sustainability to manage all natural capital, so land, air, water, and biodiversity. And it became a main goal to engage with people that were actually living on the land and the communities that wanted to do better and enable them with resources and guide them to connections and ultimately provide them with the best capability to be an environmental steward. So our mission at Land Stewardship Center is to work directly with the people to improve the understanding of healthy ecosystems. We support grassroots community stewardship efforts and we encourage the development of practices and policies that su support sustainable resource use. So stewardship in its uh, most broad sense can obviously mean different things to different people, but it is kind of that recognition of our collective responsibility to retain the quality and abundance of our land, air, water, and biodiversity and to manage it in a way that it uh, <clears throat> conserves all of its values. So not just environmental, but economic, social, and cultural. And stewardship is a journey. It's definitely not a one and done. <laughs> and that commitment comes with being a good steward uh, and takes time and effort. So some key points is kind of understanding the value of ecosystem services. So the benefits that humans get from nature, so wetlands, filter water, insects pollinate, uh, so we can, you know, it can develop into the food that we eat. And we recognize there's important stewardship priorities such as sustaining um, all different aspects of the land. Uh, some stewardship principles, you need structure, goals, communication, and lastly, learning from those who provide good stewardship examples. So a droplet in a pond may be small, but it still creates, you know, a ripple in all the directions. And I just want another poll to be brought up here. So kind of in your broadest sense as well, are you consider, uh, do you consider yourself a land steward? And it can be of different things for sure. I've I definitely found myself in more of the aquatic <laughs> steward around because I have a wetland close to my house. So it's always interesting to see. So definitely the majority of you do consider yourself. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, a learning process and it's all, oh, I guess sharing the results is good. So, <laughs> so yeah, majority of you guys do find yourself a steward, but I was going to say it's a journey and it's never kind of a one and done. So there's always time to start. So how do we do it as Land Stewardship Center? Does uh, facilitate partnerships on all levels. So individuals, grassroots organizations, uh, municipalities and government. We have service tools, which are always transforming and adapting. Uh, we support provincial and national initi initiatives. Um, <clears throat> I think one exciting thing is that we always work directly with individuals who live on land and the organizations that are responsible for managing those natural resources. 
And we kind of deliver and excel those core programs through uh, strategic direction, communication, uh, coordination, outreach, and fund development. So our three kind of main key <clears throat> approaches would be to engage. So identifying that need as a team, listening, staying informed, um, informing, so building that network, which can be new or existing, uh, enabling, so developing those solutions, which can, you know, have many different uh, kind of answers for sure. But connecting is a great foundation to support funding and capacity, which is obviously essential for implementation. And so some of our programs would be the Alberta Stewardship Network, and that kind of falls under this umbrella. We also have our Green Acreages Program, our Watershed Stewardship Grant, which I'll kind of delve into more lightly on that topic of that. And I just wanted to highlight uh, some of these programs do have funding available for various types of nonprofits and organizations. The Green Acreages Program has funding for small acreages, hobby farms, and recreational properties. Our Watershed Stewardship Grant is currently open for applications, which ends on February 14th. And we also have a Green Communities Guide, which is for kind of developers, community groups, and has transformed kind of to an online format, which has kind of a nature-based solution approach. So the biggest one I wanted to dive in is to the our watershed stewardship. So it's a huge investment in our community um, to provide kind of foundational support for groups. Uh, the funding received has enabled groups to kind of do various different types of projects. They're all different and unique from building memberships, capacity, um, kind of <clears throat> being able to mat create management plans, engaging kind of on the ground activities. There's definitely so many different types that are out there. So I wanted to definitely delve into WSG, but before I do that, I just wanted to share with you some kind of interesting information. So incorporating Indigenous knowledge provides like a deeper meaning, I believe, of sustainability. So it's an essential piece to ensuring that like your entire organization is on the same page, I found, and it should be included to some extent an understanding of why it is so valuable. So we need to do our research, which is a huge part in, in order to grasp the, the understanding. And I think one thing is being able to admit that you don't have any knowledge and to admit that there is an absence of it and that you are trying to learn. And obviously you can see there is a huge gap in the environmental workforce. And so a lot of people seeking kind of the involvement of uh, Indigenous communities, there is a need and there, the capacity sometimes isn't always there. So I did some research into some interesting things I thought people would uh, like to hear about. So Indigenous people can have that interconnectedness with nature, and they are like the true caretakers and land stewards. And this is being brought more to light through research that has analyzed land species and in Indigenous communities. So uh, their land management supports biodiversity more than we could have ever thought. So most people used to look at parks for this sort of concept. However, uh, when parks were kind of early usually established, Indigenous people were sometimes excluding, uh, excluded from using land or <clears throat> being able to kind of use it for their food or materials. And this was harmful to a lot of communities as it didn't necessarily achieve kind of that overarching and true goal of conservation. However, there's kind of that forward uh, looking way uh, into that collaboration. As in 2018, the Adeshi protected area has become the first formal Indigenous protected area and conserved area. So if you look up kind of IPCA, it's an Indigenous protected and conserved area. So those are uh, kind of the leading way into how Indigenous governments, communities and organizations are seeking ways to conserve biodiversity and work together, as well as support Indigenous rights to land, sustainable resource use and overall well-being. And so I'd like to circle back to what our Watershed Stewardship Grant has been able to do with some Indigenous-led projects. And it's been so inspiring to see more and more groups are finding out about this uh, type of funding and it's allowed them to implement some impactful changes in their, <clears throat> in their area. So I'd like to highlight them uh, and <clears throat> through some of the successful applications. So first off, we had uh, Blood Tribe First Nation, which is actually the largest First Nation in Canada. It's just south in Alberta here. They're working to revive bison populations on native grasslands, and <clears throat> uh, not only because they hold immense cultural significance, but it also will provide the nation with a sustainable harvest option. And having healthy water is imperative to the success of this future project. 
Uh, the WSG will support the establishment of protection protocols within the blood tribe and build their capacity to monitor wetlands, groundwater, and repairing areas, which also provided them kind of with that baseline data for traditional plants as well. And I had the chance to actually speak with the coordinator and the data provided will help kind of decision makers ensure future community planning will incorporate not only science-based and culture-based factors as well. And they're able to conduct bird surveys through auto recording. And this actually opened the door for them to partner with Alberta Biodiversity, Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, sorry. And yeah, they were uh, very willing and excited to have kind of that knowledge transferred. Uh, the second one here I have is the Mountain Métis, Métis Nation Association. So earlier in 2021, the MMNA established an aquatic habitat program to build local knowledge and awareness regarding aquatic habitat protection, watershed issues, and conservation efforts. The grant allowed them to extend and expand their existing program with a future goal of sustaining a locally run aquatic habitat stewardship program. Through building community capacity and knowledge of watershed issues, aquatic habitat protection conservation efforts, and meaningful negotiations as well, and input also with industry <clears throat> was able to take place. And kind of that stewardship approach will not only utilize Western science uh, perspectives, but also traditional indigenous knowledge. A program coordinator will work with elders to gather traditional indig indigenous knowledge regarding local waterways, as well as organize training session and interviews. Uh, they are able to collaborate with Mighty Peace Watershed Alliance Council, and they have kind of been able to develop that voice in future watershed management policy. And one, uh, one that I was really excited about and was able to have a really deep conversation with the coordinator uh, was with Louis Bull Tribe. Uh, First Nations Band Government is one of the four, nation of, four, goodness, <laughs> four nations of Masquishi. In 2020, LBT received funding uh, for a living classroom project, which <clears throat> will facilitate kind of the opening I think they're hoping to obviously COVID had a few setbacks when I had talked to her but it's going to be kind of the educational outdoor experience uh, classroom kind of situation it's located within <clears throat> their nation and it's actually accessible to all and it'll enable people to experience the wandering trails through the transition of prairie uplands riparian vegetation and uh, wetland water bodies Throughout the classroom, there will be interactive signage, will inform visitors of the importance of these habitats for watershed health, it'll promote knowledge and stewardship. And they're actually be, uh, were able to uh, hire a local artisan to incorporate um, traditional and indigenous knowledge, provide and providing that heightened level of understanding and connection to the land. And the project was highly collaborative, uh, she said, and LBT has worked closely with Solstice Environmental, the Battle River Watershed Alliance, and the First Nations Technical Advisory Group, which uh, kind of helped uh, with photography as well as the signage. So in her words, she said that kind of this project was a great opportunity for reconciliation in the county of Wetaskiwin. Uh, it's kind of opened up that door for students in uh, Pinoco, Wetaskiwin, and Meskwishi and share how indigenous knowledge can support Western science. This <clears throat> experimental kind of classroom inspired a great appreciation and understanding of the importance of the land within kind of that like shared resources kind of type style. And she was actually the first Aboriginal woman to receive a biology degree from the University of Alberta. And with the numbers still kind of uh, disproportionately low, she is aware of the importance of encouraging Indigenous youth to pursue careers in science, engineering, technology, and math. So she's seen kind of that similar, what I showed you earlier, the importance of that education, education system being able to be open to uh, Indigenous uh, communities and people. And, doo -doo -doo. and with that, that is the end of all I had to kind of share with you all. Um, if you don't already, I recommend and you kind of connect with us we have a grassroots newsletter you can follow us on facebook twitter and instagram and if you have anything else to kind of connect uh, feel free to send me an email or go to our website to find out more information on our programs or anything like that and with that if there is any questions please provide them in the chat um, or you are more than welcome to also raise your hand hopefully my video is still good and won't drop me <laughs>
but uh, if there is none, I will pass it over to Alyssa. Just giving it one second in case anyone has questions, but I'll start pulling up my uh, PowerPoint here. Uh, let me know if we're, we're good, Kelsey, if you have no questions. I think we're good to go. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alyssa Metro. I've been with the Government of Alberta in Indigenous Relations for seven years now. Uh, I originally started working on the consultation capacity program um, for Indigenous communities to participate in consultation. But now I'm an engagement advisor and I primarily work with other government departments. Uh, so I provide advice on how they should include Indigenous people in their initiatives and programs uh, related to land and natural resources, I'll specify. Uh, I have an environmental background, though. I uh, have done some wildlife field work and I'm also a member of several conservation groups. Uh, today I'll be giving a presentation from a government perspective. So I represent the government. I don't represent any Indigenous community. I'm not Indigenous. Um, I'll be speaking with the understanding today that some people here won't have much of a, um, will have limited knowledge about engaging with Indigenous people. So I'll be starting at kind of a, a basic level here. So I just wanted to briefly um, touch on consultation versus engagement. Um, I won't get into a lot of details here. I just want to acknowledge that uh, First Nations have treaty rights protected by Section 35 of the Constitution Act. Alberta also recognizes traditional uses Indigenous people have on the land, and there are legally required duty to consult. Um, there is a legal duty to consult whether there's a potential impact to treaty rights. This is more referring to proponents in the government when they have a project with shovels in the ground and they have to consult with Indigenous communities by law. This may not apply to your initiatives. Um, engagement, however, has a much more broad scope. Uh, it's not legally required. The government does it as a matter of good governance. Um, and for you guys, there'll be lots of purposes here, like um, it's a relationship building. You'll have Indigenous inclusion on uh, land planning and it's a step towards reconciliation. My background is more engagement and what my presentation is coming from today. So I just wanted to quickly bring to your attention the differences and the fact there is a legal duty to consult in Alberta. Uh, so you want to inform Indigenous communities about your initiative. Who should you reach out to? Here are some examples of Indigenous communities and organizations in Alberta. Most Indigenous groups prefer to be engaged on a community level, but larger organizations might be more appropriate depending on your initiative. Alberta has a government called the, has a document, sorry, <laughs> called the Guide to Indigenous Organizations and Services in Alberta that might be helpful. Obviously they have um, other lists of Indigenous communities as well. Just to explain these groups, um, if you're looking at community level, you'll be wanting to engage with First Nations, um, Métis settlements, Métis locals, non-status communities. Treaty organizations, if you're not familiar, there's Treaty 8, Treaty 6, and there's a couple Treaty 7 organizations. Uh, and those most First Nations in the province fit under one of those. Um, tribal councils are a grouping of First Nations that may range usually from like two to, to eight or so. And they're usually uh, connected to each other through history or priorities. Then there are Métis organizations like the Métis Settlements General Council and the Métis Nation of Alberta and other grassroots organizations. Um, these may or may not represent any individual community, but they may be a group of indigenous um, citizens who are working towards us specific conservation goal. Um, so it's just to give you a bit of an overview of, of who to look for. So uh, who specifically is in your project area? This can be a difficult part of the process. Um, many indigenous communities have been restricted to an incredibly small land base that differed from their traditional territory. Uh, so while you may see their community is located in a certain area, historically they traveled across Alberta as part of their traditional way of life. Therefore, although your project may appear to be far away from the community, they may still have interest and knowledge in that land. 
You can refer to various maps to get you started. Um, the one on the right there is from the Alberta Teachers Association. The government of Alberta, federal government has maps as well. Um, this nativeland.ca website has a really cool and um, intuitive map of traditional territories. Uh, so that would be a good one to check out as well. The point is to cast your net wide. So you can explain the scope of your project and they can let you know if they think it's um, of interest to them or not. It's better to allow opportunities for involvement than to leave groups out. Now that you've gotten a list together of communities you might want to contact, um, try to learn a bit more about them, like their location, where is their reserve or community, what is their traditional territory. Sometimes that's a bit harder to find, um, may not be available. Understand their history, uh, their relationship to other communities, what language does their community speak, um, is there any well-known events in the community like powwows or rodeos. Attending community events is a very valuable way to build relationships. Um, they appreciate your interest in learning about their culture. Will all of these questions come up during discussing your project? Probably not, but relationship building goes two ways and learning some basics about their community is just um, respectful and can go a long way. So now again, who do you specifically talk to from the community? Um, the government of Alberta has an up-to-date list of consultation contacts for each First Nation Métis settlement. So um, this is just for First Nations Métis settlements. The other groups won't apply for this, but um, this is the list that companies use to notify communities about a project in their consultation area. So this is a good starting point um, because these contacts, their work focuses on land and natural resource projects, and they can liaise between their leadership and you or probably point you to the right contact in the community. Um, you can also visit the website for each community and organization you have identified. They may use uh, like a contact us form like you can see on the on the left there, or you can find the appropriate contacts on their website. You might be looking for names like consultation manager, lands manager, environmental liaison, or um, maybe band manager. So what kind of protocol should you take into consideration um, when you're, if you're hosting an event, let's say, um, you want to support your attendees by providing funding for a gas, potentially other expenses to attend, um, honoraria for attending for the day, maybe even offer rides to elders to the event or site. Um, if there's a meeting prior to the event, consider going to the community for the meeting. There's protocol for giving a prayer. So if you have an elder, you wish to have a, um, wish to give a prayer at your event, um, tobacco is often given. There might be some variations in protocols. So feel free to just ask the elder what's appropriate for their community. And land acknowledgements. Um, right now is um, very common to be giving land acknowledgements before events. Um, make sure you give a meaningful acknowledgement and try not to read directly from the paper, just um, speak from the heart and it doesn't have to be some of the typical scripts that you've seen. Um, just give an honest and uh, heartfelt protocol or land acknowledgement, sorry. Um, so these are some best practices for meaningful engagement. Um, active listening, of course, informal meetings. Can you walk through the site and just talk instead of sitting in a conference room with a PowerPoint? Um, so it's a good idea to give food and drinks. Um, follow up on your commitments. If you mentioned following up with some information, make sure you do so. If you couldn't get the information, uh, share that as well. Allow for flexible um, process and timelines. Perhaps you thought this would be a one or two engagement meetings in a month with an Indigenous community and that would be sufficient for your needs. Realistically, you may meet once or twice to discuss the project, then maybe they would like to complete a mapping assessment. Um, maybe they want to get elders out on the land. Maybe they want to do that in different seasons. So be prepared for this kind of flexibility. Um, follow cultural protocol. I just discussed this. Um, and as well as relationship building outside of the project. I touched on this earlier, but attending events in the community uh, and meeting in the community go a long way as well. And of course, kind of an obvious statement, but be genuine, be truthful, um, very important for building trust.
So um, Leroy Little Bear, he's an elder and indigenous scientist from Blood Tribe, talks about how a worldview includes how the person or group interacts with the world around them, including land, animals, and people. Um, indigenous cultures focus on a holistic understanding of the whole that emerged from millennia of their existence and experiences. Western worldviews tend to be more concerned with uh, science and concentrate on com compartmentalized knowledge rather than focused on understanding the big picture. Considerations of indigenous worldview should inform um, the organization structure of your engagement sessions and think that nothing is out of scope with a worldview. Are there opportunities to braid knowledge systems of indigenous knowledge in Western science? Um, for example, elders and community members could share indigenous knowledge about the migration locations of bison during calving season. This would be shared with their organization and perhaps they want to protect that information through a data sharing agreement. The indigenous knowledge informs or confirms the Western science research that the organization has completed on the project. Um, so this was a very quick and basic presentation that I hope gets you going in the right direction. As you can see, there's a lot of information to look at. Um, I'll emphasize the need for flexibility in your process and of course, um, respect with those you want to participate in your engagement sessions. Um, so yeah, we have time for questions now, I think, or at the end, we can throw them in the chat. Yeah. I haven't seen anything pop up while you're speaking, but I was gonna say, yeah, if anything, we can always address some stuff at the end or maybe share the odd story or two, if that's something you'd like to do. So with that, Bob, I will give you the floor. Okay. <laughs> In Wigan, I'm a squishy with Kaiganik, and in Mama Munyala Quail, Hegua, Nepapa, Tipanasuak, Napio. Good morning, everyone. Mio Gisigo. Good day. Uh, my name is Bob Montgomery. I am Metis on my dad's side and settler Canadian of Scottish descent on my mom's side. So I take take both of those identities and um, try and weave together a life that lives up to uh, ancestral responsibilities, including uh, uh, ethics and, and the ways that I, I walk through my days. Um, I'm gonna share with you, and thanks to both Kelsey and Alyssa, I'm gonna share with you some more specific information of what we do in the Beaver Hills biosphere. So Kelsey briefly mentioned that I am the Indigenous Engagement Coordinator at the Beaver Hills biosphere. Uh, let me start this presentation here. Um, so my work really is around, similar to what Alyssa does, I, I work uh, to connect and build relationships with Indigenous organizations, community members, elders, knowledge holders, youth, um, in an effort to really make sure that they have access to their traditional territories that we now um, have a UNESCO site upon, but recognizing that, of course, they were here first and Indigenous people were forcefully removed from the Beaver Hills during European settlement in the late 1800s. Uh, and so we have a responsibility to, to sort of write that, um, that fissure in their, in their identities and their histories. Most indigenous people draw their identities from the land. So you can imagine how traumatizing it is to be removed from the land. Um, my family doesn't come from here. Um, we, uh, my Métis side of my family did spend quite a bit of time in Edmonton, but then moved to Rocky Mountain House down to Montana for a time and then settled around the southwestern part of the province in between Pincher Creek and Waterton Lakes. Um, so I, 
we wouldn't have spent much time in the biosphere, but it does have a rich history of Métis presence and um, Indigenous presence as a really rich place to gather and hunt and harvest and all these things. So uh, similar to what Alyssa said, we have a, a written Indigenous land acknowledgement. Um, I, I can be quite critical of land acknowledgements, especially when they're read uh, straight off the page. As Alyssa said, I think coming from the heart is really important. And a lot of Indigenous people and communities have criticized land acknowledgements as somewhat empty gestures in the last few years because they um, they acknowledge, but there's no action necessarily to couch that knowledge in. So I think it's really important that we identify not only the communities who whose land we're, we're sitting on, but also recognize our responsibilities and some actions that we can take. So with the biosphere, we've developed some action steps that we can take based on acknowledging whose land we are on and what responsibilities we have with them. I won't read all of these out for you, but um, just ensuring that Indigenous peoples are involved in the work that we do, um, making sure that Indigenous peoples have safe access to land and uh, within the biosphere for things like ceremonies and medicine picking and hunting, harvesting. Um, we're also working at disrupting our own assumptions and um, challenging our, our misunderstandings of Indigenous culture and, and um, practices. Uh, we acknowledge that conservation has been a tool of colonialism and um, it has been, been used as a way of restricting access to Indigenous people or for Indigenous people to access their land. So as an example, in Jasper National Park, all Indigenous people were removed from their territory to create a park of pristine wilderness. And of course, um, we're now starting to realize or Western science is starting to catch up to the idea that having Indigenous people in the landscape is really critical to the well-being of the landscape. Kelsey mentioned Schuster as a, a, one of the scientists working on this, but uh, you'll often hear that 80% of biodiversity exists on indigenous um, controlled or co-managed lands across the world. And in Canada, biodiversity is higher on indigenous managed or co-managed lands than it is even in parks and protected areas. So it's really important to understand how critical indigenous knowledge and practices are to any, any land-based conservation that we're doing. So, um, Alyssa briefly mentioned treaties. It's important to remember that these treaties are living documents and it's a really critical thing that all of us spend time reflecting on what benefits we receive from treaty. So I think a lot of people sort of forget that the Crown signing treaty with Indigenous people provided huge benefits to white settlers and being the descendants of those folks, we have uh, huge economic benefits from that. So 99.8% um, of land in Canada is controlled by non-Indigenous people. And if you think of all of the economic activity in Canada, uh, you'll, you'll know that a lot of it is land-based. Um, resources, etc., that come from those lands. And so if, if economies um, are benefiting from those lands, then only having access to 0.2% of that land, you can understand would really cripple the, the ability of Indigenous people to um, be thriving or taking care and or taking care of the land. So reflecting on the benefits that we receive and then realizing that there's what I like to call a reciprocal deficit. So since we benefited so much as um, 
newcomers or settlers, you'll hear a lot of different terms for that. We have to understand that treaties were in the spirit of reciprocity and sharing of the land and uh, the Crown or, or Canada and Canadians have um, created legislation that doesn't really allow for equitable sharing of those, those resources and lands. And so we have, the result is a reciprocal deficit. And what that means is we haven't, we've gained a lot more than we've actually been able to give back. Um, and, and that's legislation that's decades and decades old. I don't want anyone to leave here feeling personally guilty of this, but I think that the important part is we recognize that this is the case and try and work against it. So um, when doing engagement, I always start with this understanding that we're, we're coming from a place of we've already been given a lot and so if any of you have friends that only call you when they need 20 bucks or they got to borrow your car, uh, that, that type of relationship really doesn't feel good. It, um, it can start to get irritating. And so you can start to understand that um, how indigenous community members or even nations on a nation basis, would start to feel when we only contact them when we want to do a project. So I think in regard to that, it's important that engagement happens and relationships are built, um, as Alyssa mentioned, with genuine interest and curiosity about people and a hope of, of building a more deep relationship than a, a transactional one where we only kind of come to them when we want to do a project uh, with them and be mindful of, of what the benefit balance is and the power balance is in those relationships because it can really throw off um, how engagement goes. And um, saying all that, engagement has to be systemic. So it has to be pervasive throughout the whole organization pardon me, or at least that we're working toward that. If there's one or two people in your organization who are really passionate about this and want to build good relationships, that's a good start. But it has to um, pervade through the whole organization because when it comes to policies and practices, uh, we have to start looking at how those might be barriers or inequitable to Indigenous people and in their participation in uh, working with us. So as an example, I'm just giving you a brief example of some of the, or our sort of plan that was developed. And my apologies for my presentation not being as aesthetically beautiful. And this is the only real graphic you're going to get. Uh, no beautiful pictures of the land. Um, so hats off to the first two, but you're going to have to deal mostly with my voice for this. But these are the um, three main ways or three main groups that we want to work with. So working with Indigenous communities, elders, youth, professionals, etc. Um, and oops, pardon me, put back here. And then working with the uh, BHB board, staff members, landowners, and I actually can't see this part. I'm not sure how to move this. Oh, here we go. And then working with the Canadian Biosphere Reserve Association, Indigenous Circle, and Regional Biosphere. So those are other organizations that we have that um, we can work with. And all of these groups, when I say systemic, have to have a deep understanding of what their responsibilities are and how to live out those responsibilities, as I mentioned previously. Those all go into this uh, little mixing pot where Indigenous people have opportunity to build relationships with the land within Beaver Hills Biosphere, relationships with the staff and organization of the Beaver Hills, and as well with our governance practices. And all of that, when it gets mixed together, leads towards something that we're hoping for, 
which is probably a ways off, which is indigenous and Beaver Hills biosphere co-management. So this just gives a brief introduction of what it means to work with indigenous communities. Um, it has to be for the benefit of indigenous communities and they have to have a clear understanding of how this positively impacts their communities. Uh, again, starting with a reciprocal deficit and how, how we can use our capacity to, to give back and um, work with them to meet their goals rather than focusing on the benefits for us necessarily. Um, and understanding, as, as Alyssa said, that relationships take time. So with the Indigenous Circle and Regional Biospheres and CEBRA, um, making sure that we connect with some of the work that they've already done. So the Indigenous Circle is a group of elders and knowledge keepers from each of the 18 biospheres across Canada, and they've been guiding the work of the Canadian biospheres over the last four or five years, maybe longer, maybe up to 10 years. I'd have to get the actual date that they started, but in 2016, they met and created something called the Making a Promise Statement, which connects Indigenous people to the land and that they need to be involved. It's their responsibility to be involved in any of the conservation work that happens on their traditional lands. And then with, within the Beaver Hills biosphere, building our capacity. So some of the ways we do that is I host an Indigenous book club where we read books at the intersection of Indigenous conservation. And um, we start to ask questions in a really informal way. And any of you are welcome to attend that. We've just started the winter version. Or, um, the winter session and we're reading this book uh, called The Seed Keeper, which I'll show you in a minute. <coughs> Pardon me. And just finding different ways to, uh, what Kelsey and Alyssa both alluded to, build our own understanding and do our own figuring out of who Indigenous people are, what kind of cultures exist, uh, what communities would have spent time in the Beaver Hills and what our responsibilities are to them. And that would go all the way to developing policies and practices. So I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds here, but as we build staff capacity, we understand that we can change policies and practices to align more with Indigenous understandings um, and be more friendly to Indigenous people who may partner with us or sit on our board or work with us, um, that their cultures and attitudes and understandings are reflected in their workplace. It's really critical. Um, making sure that we have, uh, that we facilitate connections between Indigenous people and their lands. They've been removed from the Beaver Hills biosphere for 150 years or more and moved onto reserves. So that fissure in their connection to land really inhibits their ability to uh, live out their cultural responsibilities, to engage in ceremonies that um, take place or took place within the biosphere. And we have a lot of work to do to help remove the barriers and create access so that those um, disconnections can be reformed and they can start building relationships with the land back. Um, that's a really key piece and that's really the focus of our, or me, our engagement plan at present. And then later on we'll focus on how the governance of Indigenous or how Indigenous governance can positively benefit the Beaver Hills biosphere and Seabra generally. Um, and it has to be locally based. So Cree governance practices are gonna look different than Haudenosaunee or Mi'kmaq um, practices. So depending on where you are, uh, I know some folks are not from Alberta and maybe not even from Treaty 6. So have to follow the guidelines and really get to know Indigenous people to start 
understanding what changes you can make within your organization. Um, but as I said, this, this is a ways off for us. It's really about repairing the relationship between indigenous folks and land. And then we can start to look at the overlap between Western conservation practices and indigenous conservation practices and expand that out to develop something into cooperative co-management. Um, the action steps again, and that is the basics of what we're doing. Um, I know that's a pretty big info dump and I didn't need a lot of time for questions, so I will close there uh, by saying thank you all. I'm really grateful for your time today and Kelsey and Alyssa for sharing this space with me. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much, Bob. That was awesome. And thank you, Alyssa, again. Uh, I was going to say, uh, before I get to a question and a couple that I actually have for you, Bob, um, I couldn't agree more with kind of finding that one person or if you have kind of that capacity to hire someone to do kind of engagement. But even kind of in with my nonprofit, I had that passion and then whatnot. So I reached out to kind of an uh, initiative that's doing research in our lakes and yeah they're working with like the local first nation and and quick connection we're all on the same page so it's just really i think inspiring to kind of start that journey and i kind of what you guys both said is yeah you have to respect it with time it's definitely not uh, quick <laughs> and easy kind of thing so i offered to go out in my chest waders and help with sampling and kind of just start that relationship on kind of an interesting level so I have one question, so I'm not too sure who would be the most appropriate, but it's from Randy. He has been working um, to collaborate with Indigenous communities specifically on a watershed management plan, and he finds that there's not much information uh, offered or knowledge being shared. Uh, he was speaking with an Indigenous friend about this and mentioned sometimes there is a FOIP issues, so around sharing knowledge because uh, within the community there's kind of like a private manner or members do not have the authority to share the information or knowledge. So that's uh, something I am not very well of, uh, very well aware of. So I don't know if Alyssa or Bob or if you're able to speak to that. Um, I, I can give a comment. Um, I don't know, it's a good point, and I don't know like what um, what has happened in your relationship so far and who you've been speaking to, but um, definitely they're not just going to, you know, here's our map, here's our info. Um, often they want to bring an elder out on the ground, um, and the elder will be the one to give permission for the information to be shared if they want it to be shared. Um, I did mention data sharing agreements, which um, they may want to um, sign one of those for you guys to share information just because like you mentioned, their information is sacred and they don't have, uh, the members who are not elders may not have permission to just share any information. Um, so you might have to dig a bit deeper in your relationship, just ask them what they need to be able to share information if they're willing. Um, and yeah, just see what else you can do to to make them more comfortable about the situation and if they an offer to give them a data sharing agreement or something like that if they're interested. For sure. Awesome. Uh, I don't know if you have anything, Bob. I would echo mostly what Alyssa said. Mm -hmm. I think um, the other thing to remember is um, if you're not there in your relationship or maybe you'll never get there um, is to understand that it's okay for people to say no, right? Like they may not have the capacity, especially with COVID, I find it's really difficult to connect with the people who have that knowledge or the, the rights to share it. And um, it may be a capacity issue, but it may also just be that, um, it's not a priority. There's all sorts of reasons why. Um, and you just do your best to, to maintain the relationship regardless of their participation or, or non-participation because um, they have a right to say no. And there's, there's very few routes for Indigenous people to say no. Um, often 
Melissa mentioned the consultation process. Um, but unfortunately, even though UNDRIP, uh, the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People, stipulates that Indigenous people should have to provide pre, prior, and informed consent on all projects. That's not actually implemented into law in most areas. Um, and so I think, you know, working past consultation to a more engagement platform, as Alyssa mentioned, involves respecting UNDRIP and, and the rights of communities to not give consent to whatever project you're doing, and then maybe try and figure out what they need. Um, maybe they want to work on something else that's not a watershed management mm -hmm. plan. Yeah. And then we're always, uh, in a sense, we're very environmental focused. So there can be uh, lots of other things they might uh, be prioritizing other than stuff like that. Um, but we have people slowly trickling away. So I just wanted to let everyone know that we will be doing a follow-up survey, just kind of gauge uh, everyone's thoughts on the presentations, as well as kind of some even proposed next step, uh, next steps forwards for the Stewards in Motion webinars. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. And I hope you kind of uh, were able to take some information and be able to bring it back to uh, either just for yourself or to your organization or anything like that. And yes, so with that, I think again, <laughs> Bob and Alyssa. And yeah, if there, I don't see any kind of any uh, questions, just lots of thank yous from to the presenters and stuff in the comments. So with that, I will say goodbye to everyone and I will talk to you later, Bob and Alyssa. Thanks, <laughs> Kelsey. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks all for coming.